Good morning. My name is Rachel Farad, and I'd like to welcome all of you to the Ethical Culture Society of Bergen County. We will be recording the platform address, including the Q&A, and posting it on Facebook, web, um, our website, and YouTube. For those of you who are unfamiliar with ethical culture, we are a humanist congregational movement about 150 years old, dedicated to exploring the ways in which we can live meaningful and ethical lives. Unlike a traditional religious group, there is no supernatural component to our services, but that said, there is no requirement of belief or non-belief in our movement. That's a matter between you and your conscience. Our motto is deed before creed. We believe that how you act in life is more important than any creed you might espouse. Our speaker this morning will be Bill Baird, who has been fighting for the nation's right to reproductive privacy since 1963. He is responsible for bringing five cases before the U.S. Supreme Court. Baird v. Eisenstadt legalized birth control for unmarried people and is the foundation for Roe v. Wade and other right to privacy cases, including involving LGBTQ rights. He has been warning the public about the tenuousness of the U.S. Supreme Court in terms of reproductive rights. Unfortunately, his predictions have now come true. As you know, uh, those of you who know me know this is um, an issue very close to my heart and uh, it's a real honor to be presiding today. At this time, I'd like to invite someone from our membership committee to make an announcement. Uh, David Bland, would you please unmute yourself? Thank you, Rachel. Yes, I'm David Bland. I'm also the administrative director of the society. If anyone here would like to find out more about us, you can go to our website, ethicalfocus.org, or shoot me an email at, at admin at ethicalfocus.org. And those two things, the website and my email, ha have been put in the chat window by our Zoom master, Peter Casteris. Thanks. All right. Um, I now will introduce our Sunday School Director, Samantha Stankevich, um, <laughs> to talk about our Sunday School. Yes, so um, the uh, Ethical Education Committee just met, and so I do have an update, which is that um, a couple neat things are going to be happening. Uh, next month in March, we're going to be meeting on March 7th. Um, the theme is actually ethical culture and helping the kids come up with their elevator speech. As we all know, sometimes it's good to help our little ones refresh what the words ethical culture mean and how to explain it to their friends. Um, in April, we're going to be celebrating Earth Day, um, hopefully outside together. And in May, uh, we have reinvented the um, Uganda dinner. So in the past, for anybody who remembers, we would have the children create a large dinner. I say children create, of course, all by themselves. Um, and then uh, you generous folk would come to our dinner and celebrate it, and we would send money to Uganda. Um, since we can no longer do that, we are actually planning to meet uh, outside at um, Vanson Park and have the kids write postcards to all of you guys to ask for your generous donations so that we can still support Uganda. The kids are still doing something and they will be able to hopefully do it in person and, um, and have their little letter writing campaign. So, um, so you can expect that in May and hopefully the weather will cooperate and there will be a great day together outside. Excellent, thank you so much. And thank you for all your hard work in this difficult time holding the Sunday School together. It's not easy. All right, music today will be introduced by Greg Gordon. Um, I'm very fortunate to, uh, to share with you that today's uh, artist is Sophia Chang. Sophia is 17 years old. Um, she is a senior at Suffern High School, and she's been a student of my mother, Azar Gordon, for many years. Um, I've watched Sophia uh, grow into uh, a beautiful person, but an amazing pianist as well. I'm in awe of how talent talented she is. And I'll admit at times, uh, it makes me feel bad that she could be so good and so young, and I never got close to where she is. Today, she will be performing Beethoven's Sonata Opus 27, number two, the third movement. Beethoven uh, was born in 1770 and died in 1827. His music represents a transition from the classical period to the romantic era. 
He is sometimes referred to as the emancipator of music. He ushered in the freedom to play with emotion and hot passion and paved the way for the great romantics such as Chopin, Liszt, Tchaikovsky, Rachmaninoff, and more. Uh, this particular sonata has three movements and is very famous for the first movement as, um, as it's sometimes referred to as the Moonlight Sonata. So with that, we introduce Sophia Chang playing the third movement of Beethoven's uh, Opus 27, um, Sonata number two. Okay, this girl is amazing. Check it out.
Absolutely beautiful. Okay. Oh. Now to introduce our speaker, uh, Bill Baird, reproductive, reproductive rights pioneer, began his crusade for reproductive freedom in 1963, when as a clinical director for a birth control manufacturer, he witnessed the horrifying results of an attempt at self-induced abortion. He has been arrested and jailed several times for his work, which has included establishing the nation's first physician staff nonprofit birth control abortion facility in 1964, helping to implement birth control rights for all with the Baird versus Eisenstadt Supreme Court decision in 1972, and suing the FBI in 1980 for its failure to investigate anti-abortion terrorists. In 2002, Bill Baird co-authored and signed a historic agreement between the pro-choice and anti-abortion sides in an effort to stop inflammatory rhetoric, which leads to violence. For the last 15 years, Bill Baird has been speaking to various groups about his five US Supreme Court cases, including three that bear his name. Yes. All right. Well, first of all, thank you so much. And I have to say before I begin, that young lady is a true genius. Well, I still play a piano with a little music book that has A, B, C marked down for me <laughs> called Easy Plane. <laughs> and I marvel at the brilliance of somebody like this. It's absolutely stunning. At any rate, regarding my efforts for, believe it or not, almost 60 years now, it's been a long, tough fight. Uh, some days I wonder if anybody even hears what I'm saying because my basic message has been simply this. Every woman has a right to make a decision which she thinks is right for her. If she thinks that birth control is appropriate, her decision. She thinks abortion is right, her decision. No husband, no government, no religion has a right to force a woman to do anything on her body regarding reproductive rights without her total consent, period. Why that began at the introduction, it was mentioned that I worked for a drug company and part of that drug company responsibility as clinical director, I coordinated research in different hospitals and they even sent me out to the public at drugstores. They would run ads in newspapers and the ads would say, EMCO has medical director Bill Baird come into your area. He will discuss birth control and give away non-prescriptive items to you free. Uh, all you have to do is attend. He's there from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. So you can imagine it was a pretty long day and I literally talked to sometimes hundreds of people per day. And I found out the ignorance of people about their own body was appalling. Uh, I found women who thought that if they jumped up and down, it could dislodge a pregnancy. I found women who would say that if their boyfriend uh, wanted to terminate the pregnancy with her approval, he would punch her in the abdomen, uh, throw her down a flight of stairs. I said, this is insane. Somebody ought to do something about this. So my responsibility with the drug company was I coordinated this research all over the country. And Harlem Hospital, which is a big hospital in New York City, basically was poor people. I was coordinating the research and I heard an earth shattering scream, ran into the hallway and I saw a young Afro-American woman, perhaps 29 years old, staggering and she was about to fall. I raced her and I caught her in time and uh, I held her and she literally died in my arms. But I noticed that she had an eight inch piece of coat hanger sticking out of her body. As if somebody had thrown a can of red paint on her. She was covered with blood and she cried something about nine children. And I felt so badly. And then I asked people, I said, is this common at home? Oh yeah, we have this all the time. She's been here before. So I said, maybe somebody would do something about these laws. So I went to Planned Parenthood after I finished the coordinating the research and they said, what's the matter with you, Bear? Don't you know it's against the law? Of course it's against the law. You're in fight the law. You fight injustice. I went to the Board of Health. Same story. I went to each one of the different groups. Nobody wanted to do anything because it was unpopular. Planned Parenthood had a case coming up before the Supreme Court that said married people should have the right to birth control. And I spoke with them and I said, you know, why are you segregating women from medical care who are not married? Why does the church say 
that if you're married, you have certain privileges, but if you're unmarried, you have none. And I said, that seems to me wrong. So I said, somebody ought to fight the law, but nobody would. So I decided, well, what I'll do, uh, and I got the permission of uh, the drug company. I went around into Harlem in different areas, uh, the poor areas, and I went to tenement houses, poor places. And I would say to the fellow, look, here's a tip for 25 bucks. Take this money, but let me come back at night and I'll come in my own time and I'll teach birth control to them. I said, sure, I have no problem with that. One of the $25. After I did that, I came back a month later. It was well attended. I said, you can't come here anymore. I said, why? My priest says, I'm going to rot in hell. I'm going to burn in hell because you're helping the devil. So I couldn't get anywhere, any place. My brother was very prominent in, um, you may have heard him, Dr. Robert Baird in Harlem. He founded something called the Haven Clinic. And I went there a couple of occasions to see how he was doing things. And I noted that he had a little 13 year old girl that was there at the time I came in. And at 13, she was a prostitute, but drug addicted. And she was a prostitute because she needed money for the addiction. And as you probably know, heroin goes through the placental barrier and if she had a baby, the baby would be born addicted and often would die. So I said, boy, this is really pretty horrible. So bit by bit, uh, I decided I'm gonna do something on my own. And so I decided I would rent or not rent to buy a truck. You ever hear of these uh, you know, old United Parcel trucks? You know, the entrance on the side and then the entrance on the back. Well, I bought one and I was gonna make it into what I called a plan van. I would drive it into poor areas like Harlem, Bedford, Stuyvesant, and I would teach poor people birth control on my own time, not on the company time, weekends and at night. And I did. And somehow word got out that the police would threaten to jail me because law 1142 said, anyone who prints, publishes, or exhibits any means of birth control would face a one year jail term. And I looked around, New Jersey, where you are, was also a jail term, a one year jail term. So I said, boy, that sounds really nuts to me. And I said, I really can't believe they're gonna put me in prison for just giving a free lecture and free birth control products, uh, over the counter products. And I said, well, I'll try it. And if I go to jail, I'll fight it through the courts and maybe I could be heard by the US Supreme Court. And if you don't know this, 95% of all cases are rejected by the US Supreme Court. So I had a very slim chance of being heard and a big chance of going to jail for a long period of time. So at any rate, I brought with me uh, something that I thought you might get a kick out of, uh, your state. This is way back in 1966. Now, I don't know, since I'm not good with computers, if you can see this, Long Islander risk arrest challenging New Jersey law. You had in a, a town called Freehold, New Jersey, and you had a fellow by the name of Marcus Daly. And he had, came up with this incredibly stupid idea. He was going to jail in New Jersey, unwed mothers, to hold down welfare costs. I said, on what grounds could you do that? Well, if you fornicate and you're not married, there's a law in all states called fornication. So if you have intercourse, not the man, but the woman has intercourse, she can go to jail for up with a year. And I said, that seems absolutely cruel. So I called up Marcus Daly. I said, Marcus, I said, isn't that rather severe? Why don't you let me come over there and teach some birth control? He says, I have a mobile clinic, I'll go there. He said, no, you can't do that, it's against the law. I said, well, I'm gonna to come tomorrow at high noon. Well, I said, if you do, you're going straight to jail. I said, I don't know if you can do that, but I'm gonna come. And as the headline says, welfare punishment. And it said, the only one who backed me, by the way, was a man, the head of CORE, Congress of Racial Equality. No feminist group, no Planned Parenthood. Nobody would say, well, you know, we'll try to help you. Uh, so anyway, to make a long story short, I was arrested. I showed birth control and I was charged with indecent exposure of obscene objects. I was convicted and I was sentenced to prison. The reason I tell you that is that the stupidity of my fellow males 
to the dignity and freedom of women is so appalling. I sometimes wonder why women even talk to men because at that era when I began, women were so discriminated against. I don't know if you know this, women in the 60s could be raped by their husband because husbands were considered property, property of their husband. And I'm saying, boy, that's nuts. Uh, if you are familiar with papers like the New York Times, they would have big ads, female, male, want ads. And it was always the men who got the good paying jobs and women had the low paying jobs. So I said, all of that was nuts. And I said, well, maybe somebody ought to be a little bit more aggressive in saying women have rights, women have dignity, and women alone should be allowed to make their own decisions. So I decided to go on a full ad campaign of fighting. And I worked for this drug company for several years. And all of a sudden, I got a phone call. The head of the company, not an executive, but the head of the company. Baird, if you dare continue what you're doing, you're fired. A clinical director, it's a good paying job. I had small kids. I said, uh, Mr. Sonnen, you don't know me. <laughs> I said, I work over 80 hours a week. I work seven times a week, several days a week, weekends. But I said, uh, I do this at night. He says, you heard my warning. Well, on May the 9th, that's after two years of hard work for them, got a call, you're fired. Just like that. And guess what? <laughs> A uh, few, day, few days later, I got a call from the police department saying that if you come to our area, you're going to go to jail. So I said, heck with you. I drove the Mobile Clinic to Hempstead, Long Island, May the 14th. That's the week after I got fired. And out of nowhere, I heard police cars, wheels, whistles blowing, screeching brakes. He jumped out. You're under arrest for indecent exposure of obscene objects. That was a one year jail term, by the way, that I faced. I was absolutely shocked at the response. I thought, boy, people would say, good man, Baird. Instead, I got calls. How dare you corrupt our women, our women, like we own them. And to make a long story short, eventually after going back and forth, uh, Percy Sutton somehow became a supporter of me. And uh, he had me address his legislative body and they changed the law based on what I had been doing. In fact, a year later in 1966, I was appointed consultant to New York Senate to do the very thing they had put me in jail for. Then came your wonderful state. When your state, New Jersey was gonna jail on with mothers, I said, that's absolutely nuts. I fought it. Eventually I got the law changed in New Jersey. But the reason this all leads up to is it place called Boston University. I brought you this. I'm hoping you can see it. It says, would you come and fight our law? A 10 year jail term called Crimes Against Chastity. And I said to Ray Mungle, the editor of the BU News, I said, uh, look, I said, I want to help you. But once you go to Planned Parenthood, they got money. Have them fight the law. Oh no, they won't give us birth control because we're not married. And I knew that was their position in those days. They put it in writing. Uh, their writing said abortion takes the life of a child. Uh, their writing on my possession, by the way, everything I'm telling you is documented on this desk. Uh, their writing said, uh, if you're married, you can get birth control, thanks to the case called Griswold versus Connecticut. But if you're unmarried, you have to prove you're engaged to be married, and then they might let you have birth control. I said, that was absolutely nuts. So I said, tell you what, I'll fight the law. My hope was the Supreme Court would hear me. And as you may have heard me say earlier, the 95% of all cases uh, are pretty much rejected by the court. So here I gave a speech to 2000 people as a large audience. Now, how do you fight a law that you're hoping the Supreme Court would hear you, mind you? I'm not a, not a lawyer, I'm just a stubborn guy who says women have rights. And how do you challenge the law? What do you say? So the first thing I did, I held up a magazine. Please bear with me, I'm trying my best to. Can you see this? Time Magazine, the day I was arrested was April the 6th, 
1967. That's the date, the day I was arrested, ironically. But you know what I was trying to do? The law said, if you print, publish, exhibit, any means of birth control or abortion, you face 10 years in jail. So I held up Time Magazine. And my original one, I had pasted on it, the birth control pill. And on the bottom, I put St. Joseph's baby aspirin that looked like the pill. So there were at least a dozen police there. And I said, will you arrest me for showing a photograph of the pill? Because you could not show any birth control. Will you arrest me for showing the pill, the real pill, a picture of the pill, or St. Joseph's aspirin that looks like the pill? And the police looked at me, smoke coming out of the ears, but they wouldn't do anything. I said, look, I, to be heard, I got to be arrested. And I got to try to aim for the Supreme Court. So what do I do next? What would you do? I brought, took out the Bible, which I carried with me. I'm not a religious guy, but I read the, the Bible. Genesis 38, 9 through 11. God said to Onan, have intercourse with your dead brother's wife and spill your seed on the ground. Now spilling your sperm or seed on the ground is called what? Withdrawal or coitus interruptus. But wait a second. The law said anyone who prints, publishes, exhibits any means of birth control broke the law. That means every church, every temple that had a Bible broke the law. So I thought I'd get the church, who was always my enemy, uh, into court with me. They didn't move. What the heck did I do now? I, I'm there with one goal. How do you get arrested? Next thing I did. I had made, and I should confess to you, which I don't do often about how I really challenged it. I made arrangements with a 19 year old student when I first got there. In those days, if you're under 21, you were a minor. I made arrangements for a 19 year old. I said, when I ask if anybody wants birth control, I mind you, I'm clinical director for EMCO, vaginal foam, over counter item. So if anybody knows the product, it's got to be me because I'm telling doctors and research people how it's made and uh, all the side effects and so forth. And the good part, parts of it. So when I said for her to come, anyone to come up wanted, of the 2,000, really 2,500 people, one came and I handed her the phone. The moment I handed her the phone, the police rushed up and said, we got you. You're under arrest for exhibiting obscene objects, birth control devices, and giving out the can of foam. I said, hold it. And believe it or not, they did. I reached into my pocket and I took out a sales receipt. And it said, and listen to this carefully, Zare's department store. In those days, as in your state, you could buy contraceptives over the counter, condoms, phones, jellies, uh, in drugstores, and as well as inside department stores. So the receipt said, Zare's department store, $3 sales uh, for the product, nine cents sales tax. I said, wait a minute, how are you collecting an illegal sales tax because it's an illegal sale from a department store, only drugstores could sell it. And I said, I want you to arrest the attorney general. I was tweaking their nose. It's ever collecting an illegal sales tax on an illegal sale. And I thought, boy, I really gonna try get them so confused. I can get the law declared unconstitutional. Well, unfortunately, it did not work that way. By the way, I just wanted to show you this. This is the, where I faced 10 years in prison. So I wanted you to see that they didn't play games in, in Boston. Uh, US court upholds my jail sentence. By the way, the Charles Street prison was a hellhole. I had a deal with rats in my cell, threat of rape every night, beatings. Uh, but eventually the US Supreme Court decided to hear me and they released me from prison. Uh, in fact, this is when I was in prison. They drew a picture of in the Boston Globe of my being in uh, stockades. Uh, in fact, this is a book, a best-selling book called Street Soldier. Whitey Bolger was a very famous murderer and his right-hand hitman said that the only place he fear, feared was the Charles Street prison. That's the prison I was in. So you know that it was no country club. But here's the disgrace, and this is all new to you. This is what I've been fighting, not just the law, not just the Catholic Church and right-wingers, 
But I also fought Planned Parenthood. I said, this is a editorial, bad and betrayal. Planned Parenthood, when I'm sitting in prison, I'm now facing this 10 year horror prison. Planned Parenthood says nothing to be gained by the Baird case, nothing. Baird is an embarrassment to us. I said, you loose scoundrels. What I've gone through, I'm helping you who live here in this state and you're gonna to try to undercut my efforts to get this case heard by the Supreme Court. Um, so anyhow, these are all different clippings that would document what I've been fighting for. Now, the Supreme Court was a very terrifying experience because when I first went to them, they turned me down. Second appeal, they said, okay, we'll hear you. And they did hear me. If I told you what it was like to have the privilege of being heard by the highest court and recognizing I had a tremendous responsibility, I knew there were countless women across this country who were counting on me to be successful in getting this case heard. I thought that maybe the might, the wealth of Planned Parenthood, the women's groups, the ACLU, would all come to my defense. Could see, you know, maybe they didn't like, they didn't like my style. They didn't like my confronting religion. They didn't like, I said this, by the way, I forgot to tell you this. I held up a little pamphlet during the, my lecture called the Rhythm Method. And as you can guess, distributed by the Roman Catholic Church, written by the Catholic Church. And what it said was, you can prevent unwanted pregnancies by the Rhythm Method. I said, if you're gonna just arrest me, you got to arrest the Cardinal, who was a very popular Cardinal Christian, very popular man. This is Catholic Boston. So they didn't like that, nor did Planned Parenthood, nor the others, because they wrote an open letter saying how Baird is critical of the predominant faith. Yeah, I was critical. I have no fight with the Roman Catholic Church, never have. My fight has always been with the political arm of the church. <clears throat> One of these believers that you separate church from state. Uh, Orthodox Jews are opposed to abortion. You don't hear them lobbying to call abortion murder. You don't hear them trying to pass laws. You can't eat ham and eggs because they're opposed to pork. It's against their religion. Jehovah's Witnesses don't argue, well, you can't have a blood transfusion. It's against their religion. But certain religions like evangelicals today, Roman Catholic Church in the earlier days, would get up and say, it's murder. Then they would say publicly, Baird. You're a heathen. Don't you know the soul enters at conception? And when I debated them often on television, soul enters at conception. And I challenge you if you oppose. Soul enters at conception is a term called 20. 20 means when the egg is fertilized, 10 days later, develops, becomes twins, quote, splits in half. But wait a second. It becomes twins if the soul enters at conception. Does that mean 10 days later that each soul gets, each twin gets half a soul because the twin is developed and then split in half? Doesn't make sense. No one in the Bible says it say soul split in half. So I said, this is nonsense. It's nonsense. But you can't talk that way about organized religion, even though it's logical, but that makes you an evil man. They held masses for my soul, the Catholic Church in public, said I was the devil editorials. Uh, in fact, I lost my first wife and children by this headline. Can you see this? Catholic head of the police department in Suffolk County, Long Island, arranged to have the police arrest me, ordered my arrest under any grounds I gave a speech in Huntington, Long Island, where I used to live. I didn't know this. I gave my speech at the end of the speech. I heard a scream. And there's a mother holding her little baby being handcuffed. The headline says, uh, abortion advocate jailed. This baby was in the audience. They said the baby's morals would be corrupted by seeing a diaphragm, the pill, and the IUD. 
I want you to know, you gotta be pretty freaking stupid. I wish I could be kinder and I am a pretty kind person, but I can't be kind. When you blatantly use the power of the state to take this young mother, throw her to the floor, handcuff her, do the same to me, jail us overnight, face three years in prison. But went on trial, won the case, and what do you think happened? My children, I had three little children at the time, Bullinger, got a cold. They would be murdered to punish me for the rest of my life. My first wife said, in a millisecond, I'm out of here. I'm going to move to New England in Haydn and the woods they've been. Have nothing to do with my work or with me and actually believe that I put their life in danger because I had to make a judgment call. So they moved to New England. I remained in New York. I slept at the clinic. And uh, in fact, as you may know, I lost my clinic. Uh, years later, one of the terrorists came in to the clinic with a gallon of gasoline. Patients were there, 50 patients, crowded. He said, nobody move. This place is going up. And he threw the gasoline against the wall. We got everyone out alive, all 50 patients. But he burned the clinic to the ground. And this is all done in the name of God. If I sound angry, I try my best to hide it, but it is very hard to see the stupidity of people who say they are pro-life, but killing and burning to death or trying to. 50 patients, doctors, nurses, because you think you're superior morally than somebody else, or your priests are going around raping little children. You daring to tell other people what's moral? Well, I plead with you to understand this is a battle about the morality and freedom of women to decide for themselves. Do they have the freedom to say, I used a diaphragm, didn't work, or I made a mistake? I don't know if you know this. Men used to buy, in those days, you have a little pin that you put. It was from the American Association for Vasectomies. And it showed a little circle with an arrow, the male symbol, but it had a little break in it to show that the man had a vasectomy. But what the public didn't know, a lot of times if you made a donation to this group, they would send you the pin. So a guy would wear the pin and say to his girlfriend or whoever the woman was, look, I had a vasectomy. I don't have to use a condom. He never had a vasectomy. So a lot of times people would lie to each other because they were just more ego, eager to get somebody going to bed. In those days, by the way, if a man went to bed a lot, he was called Don Juan, the ladies man, super stud. Remember those days, in the 60s, 50s? Women were told if they went to bed, what a tramp, what a whore. What an easy make. Oh, she's a community chest. Women had to be sit there and wait for us men to get married to them. We men had to have the experience so we know what to do in the bedroom when we got married. Women were told, you be home, you be pure. When you get married, we men would show up in black tuxedos. Women would show up in virgin white gowns to show their purity. So all these soldiers, Social cultures that we did with women showed only the chauvinistic attitude. Men could have sex, but women could not until they were married. My, who wrote that rule? And who said that was right in the first place? So anyhow, to make a long story short, as I traveled to this nation, people came after the state of New Jersey jailed me. Uh, Wisconsin, of all places, right? I gave a speech. Well received, a thousand people. All of a sudden, kid came at the end of the speech. He says, Bill, you better get out of here. Why? He said, don't you know? It's against the law for you to show birth control. I said, yeah, but I didn't say I'm gonna challenge the law or anything. He said, well, there's a reporter here who called the police and they're coming to arrest you. 
was showing an IUD and other stuff. I said, look, my two kids are at home with chicken pox. That's too much for my wife. I've got to get back. He says, we'll get you out the back door. They snuck me out, got on a plane, went back to New York. And reporters said, oh, coward. He ran and fled the state. I didn't flee the state. I wanted to help my wife with the children. But I said, I will be back. You're sure you'll be back. And I came back. And I do this because it's hard for people to believe some of the crap I have gone through. This is Life magazine. Can't deny it's a pretty big, prominent magazine. This was in my clinic. Oh, I've got to hold on you. Okay. This was in my clinic. It says, uh, you know, that I was helping women. By the way, I was helping women get abortions since 1963, way against the law. And I did it publicly, challenged the police to it, and they, they wouldn't. Uh, but then when I was arrested, I don't know how well you can see this. When I was arrested in New Jersey, can you see people were at the airport, Oshkosh Airport, they came to arrest me. I didn't get off the airplane, but I saw a huge picket line in Oshkosh Airport. That's not right. No, but this point was that where they arrested me was at Oshkosh, and they got pictures of that in different newspapers uh, arresting me. And I'm sitting in the plane. I said, what the heck's going on? We don't know. They're going to arrest somebody on the plane. We must have a murderer or somebody that's never done this before. But I knew they were for me. So what would you do? I reached into my pocket and I took out a baby clip, a paper clip, and I took out an IUD in my pocket and I put it on my tie. Remember the law? All states had this law. If you print, publish, exhibit any means of birth control, it was a one year jail term or in Massachusetts, a 10 year jail term. So when I came down the plane, the cops were right there, half a dozen cops. They bared you under arrest. And Life magazine was there, Time, uh, all the TV cameras. But you know what I did this for? When they photographed the IUD, the law said, if you print, publish, exhibit any means of birth control, you, Mr. Life magazine and television say, you broke the same law. And this way, I thought, if they jail me, I'll use them as part of my defense. How come you can show this on the air? Nobody's having orgies because they saw an IUD. Then how are you going to put me away for a year? So anyhow, that worked. Okay. So I went from state to state and different states, eight times in five different states, put me in jail. All for the same crime, thinking they would silence me. But I guess my, my family was uh, immigrants, uh, stubborn, not well educated. Well, I was one of six kids. Uh, two of us died from the poverty. One year old baby brother died because we didn't have a doctor. 12 year old sister that probably made me become what I am died because everyone said she had a, uh, some sort of periods where they were very painful and we didn't have the money for a doctor. And when one night she screamed so badly, they rushed her to the hospital and her appendix broke. She died. And I was so angry because my parents were difficult. My father was an alcoholic. So it was a very hard childhood born in the Great Depression. Uh, word for if you're old enough to remember the word's called junking. I used to go from garbage can to garbage can at eight years old, pick up newspapers to sell it because my father would disappear. We didn't have money. So with that background, it made me say, I'm going to fight to help poor people. And no matter what anybody says, no matter how many times I'm, people pray for my death and I still get those calls, I still will believe to my dying breath that women must have this basic human right. So finally, when the Supreme Court did hear me and I won the case, I was absolutely shocked how Planned Parenthood did a reversal and said, oh, we supported the case all the while. 
we even paid for Baird's case. And after, Joe Pallero, who was my attorney, wrote a statement, which is on this desk. We never got a dollar from Planned Parenthood. Never helped us. At the end, they because we're headed to the Supreme Court, they used it as a fundraiser thing. Then what do you think happened next? Teenagers were gone after. And I said, God, if anybody needs help for abortion and birth control, don't you think it should be kids who can't afford it? 17, 16, I had, the youngest kid I had was a 12 year old raped by her father, sent to me by her mother. We aborted her free, but we went into court, sued the Nassau County Medical Center who would not give her the abortion. We won that case, the first Medicaid case in the United States. So case after case that I took on, I won. And I'm not a lawyer, but I brought the argument. So they said when it came to teenagers, if you're a teenager, you have to have the written permission of both your parents or a judge. Now, how many of you can remember when you were a teenager? If you were sexually active, you just say, hey, mom, would you sign here? I had sex with John. And dad, would you sign here? Nobody would do that. But that's what the law said. Now what do you do next? So they turned around and they said, if the child is mature, how many of you could describe for me, what is a mature adult? We had a president who I would give you two cents for, right? Who's mature. So what's a mature minor? I fought against that. And all of a sudden, believe us or not, and I'm pretty much a nonviolent person. I met my clinic in Boston. I had three clinics, nonprofit, mostly supported by my lecture fees. Ralph Nader, Dick Gregory, and myself were top three top speakers in the 60s. All of a sudden, I hear a scream in my clinic, the head nurse. I'm in the back putting away lab stuff. And all of a sudden, I hear thump, 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 thump. Oh, somebody's running down the hallway. This guy runs down the hallway, kicks the door open, and he has his hand up like this. And I thought, it's a dagger? What is it? I'm a former boxer, grew up in the slums. Block his hand, short right cross, out cold, on the floor, drag him by the back and the neck, pull him down the 100 foot corridor, steps that he comes to. I said, get out of here. Go back to your right to life, but he's not ever coming to my clinic again. Goes bouncing and runs out. I run back upstairs to see if the nurse is all right. And what do you think is happening? White as a ghost. I said, Marilyn, what happened? Don't you know what you did? Yeah, I knocked out a right to the lifer. He'll never come back here again. Oh, no, you didn't. No, you didn't. That was the United States Federal Marshal. You were being served with papers. You're being sued by Planned Parenthood to argue your case, Baird versus Bellotti, before the United States Supreme Court. What are you talking about? They said, Roy Lucas, top attorney in the United States, is not a good attorney. You're not a good clinic. They want to argue your case. I said, holy smokes. I've, I know what you would have done. But I got scared. I know what cops do to you if you knock out a, one of their buddies. So a friend at the clinic drove me to the closest state was Rhode Island, 45 minutes away. I get there, I call Joe Bolero, my attorney. He says, Barrett, where are you? Cops are looking all over the place for you. If they get to you before I see you, you're in trouble. I said, OK, I'll come right back. I ran back and I got there. Who do you think is there? the federal marshal with his voice and a bunch of people. Baird, you're under arrest for striking a federal officer. And I said, wait a minute. You never told me you were federal. You never identified. You just tried bullying me. And I defended myself. And the guy said, yeah, that's true. But you know what else? Look, he ripped my shirt. He dragged me along the floor. And Joe Bolero. <laughs> reached into his pocket, took out a wad of money and said, here, took counted out $200.
this chair couldn't have been more than what, $25? She says, here, you take it. That should settle it. The guy who will settle it. And uh, this is, they're doing uh, many stories on me and this will be in the um, feature part. When normally I have been nonviolent all these years, there comes a point when you say, enough is enough. I'm not gonna let you keep bullying me. And then what I haven't told you yet, I turned to my allies when I wanted to go to the Supreme Court, to head to uh, get the case for women's rights to be heard. I asked of all people, the natural ally, the National Organization for Women, who supported me in New York, supported me in different parts of the country, but in other parts of the country, since 1971, Betty Friedan told the New York Times and other newspapers, Baird is a CIA agent. He's a government spy. What in the world are you saying? I don't know how to fight that kind of bigotry. We say only sisterhood is powerful. I believe in sisterhood is powerful. I don't believe that you can have allies who are males. I'm the only guy in the history of this country with five Supreme Court cases five Supreme Court cases that have helped millions of women. Oh, by the way, I, I, I finally won that case, you know, the right for teenager rights. Do you know what happened? You're allowed when you win a case to ask for your money. Planned Parenthood, a document right in front of me who was allowed to argue half of my case before the Supreme Court. You know what the Boston Court did, they gave them $111,000 for their contribution to Baird versus Bilotti. And what do you think happened to me? Headline said, Baird angry at court. They would not give $1. They said you were late, which I was not in filing for your, your court course, which were $200,000, you lose it. I'm not rich. That money came from my lecture fees, from my trying to, to survive. So I only share this with you. So you can see when you fight a cause, you would think that people would do the right thing. But there's something in law, by the way, called an amicus brief children should support the rights of women. I had many encounters. Uh, this is a story I told you about Planned Parenthood. Oh, I'm so sorry. I, this was Planned Parenthood. Students pick a Planned Parenthood because they couldn't get birth control. Plan your family, it says abortion takes the life of a child. Planned Parenthood's literature. This is literature I told you about that said uh, that uh, with birth control, you have to show you can, you are engaged. But, okay, I'm sorry, I forget. 88, give me a break. Uh, here, spring newsletter, okay? Spring newsletter, publicity too much. Nothing to be gained by the Baird case. You're facing 10 years in jail. And if I win, they benefit. Okay. Uh, and by the way, I just spotted this. <laughs> I'll show you how, why, how the church came after me. This is Marlboro, Massachusetts. They fly a, a black flag at half mass. Flag flies at half mass, protest the presence of Baird. This is Planned Parenthood when they were given $114,000. I just show you some of these things to show when I saw what women went through at my clinic to get help, I'm going to gamble on this because this is what put me in prison. This is what they said. These are birth control and abortion. Here, a woman would come to me, take a, a douching bag and fill it with Lysol or bleach or turpentine. Uh, sometimes I would take a chicken uh, turkey baster Okay, they would fill this with salt water. You know, glass of water, a couple of tablespoons of salt, hypertonic solution. 
squeeze his heart, you force it into the uterus, and a woman might abort. But when you squeeze his heart, you force air into a blood vessel. Remember when you go to a doctor and they give you an injection and they press the plunger so they depress any air bubbles that might be trapped? Well, when you squeeze this hard, this residual air, if you tr force that air into a major blood vessel, you can die of an air embolism. People would take coat hangers, wrap the a little piece, wrap the end of it with adhesive tape so it's not so sharp. Uterus is about the size of your fist, a little opening called the cervical os. Gently insert that in, push that too hard, and you push it through the wall of the uterus into the bowel, you can hemorrhage to death. So these are the techniques that people do. A catheter, a piece of plastic tubing. This is a catheter, but here's a piece of plastic tubing that you use if you've got fish tanks at home and you run a piece of copper wire through the length of it to give it stability. The cervical os has the opening of the uterus. You push that in, push that too hard, you perforate the uterus. You can hemorrhage to death. So I gave that in all my lectures, trying to show people what not to do, what not to do. On the other side, I'll show you this. This is what got them really ranked. Most of my imprisonments have been for showing. Do you recognize what this is? Diaphragm. See, the diaphragm comes in different sizes. Has to be measured by a physician. You insert it. I had teenagers who borrowed their mother's diaphragm didn't know that they have to be measured or fitted. Or sometimes they would put Vaseline. Why can't you use Vaseline with a rubber diaphragm so it would slide in easier? You ever go to a junkyard? I don't want an advantage of my being poor. I used to bring newspapers to sell into the junkyard. Uh, like, <laughs> believe it or not, uh, 75 cents for 100 pounds. But if you put Vaseline on this, if you saw tires at a junkyard and grease got on it, they would rot, they would crack. So if you put Vaseline on a rubber diaphragm, this is rubber, so what happens? It develops cracks and the sperm goes through the crack. This is a foam, known for oxypolyacetanol, spermicide, inserted inside the vagina. It's reasonably effective. But you know what a lot of people do? After they use this, after intercourse, they take a shower. If water gets into the vagina, this is made to be soluble in water. So if you take a shower, water gets into the vagina, you dilute the chemical that kills the sperm. Something called withdrawal. You ever use the Long Island Railroad? I don't know how old you are, but years ago, if you advertise uh, you saw the uh, Long Island Railroad would advertise, we pull out on time. <laughs> well, how many guys would say to you, we pull out on time, I'll pull out on time. I don't know if you know this. The uterus, the uh, penis rather has a tube called the urethra. The urethra has urine go through it, as you know. What's the pH of, ur of, uh, of uh, urine? pH is acidic. Sperm can't live in that. So what the body does, it releases a clear sticky fluid called the precoital flow. That fluid is alkaline. So it neutralizes the acidity. And so when a guy enters a woman, sometimes that precoital flow can impregnate her. Certainly you know about the condom. How many guys carry condoms in their wallet? or they carry them in the glove compartment. What does the cold do or heat do to rubber? Cause it to crack. So these are the different techniques that people would use. So all I try to say to you is, in fact, I give a whole lecture called Misconceptions That Cause Conceptions. So all of these things have to be taught in, in schools, but we don't do that. So let me just sum this up. I'm a fighter for your rights. I'm not a politician. I'm not gonna sugarcoat. We're in trouble. Women are gonna die again. 
when we're going to suffer again. I vowed to that dying woman that I would fight with every bone in my body till I die and I'm 88 and I'm still fighting. Please get involved. Write letters to politicians. Get Planned Parenthood and the others to work with all of us together. Women cannot say it's a women's movement. It's a movement for humanity, all of us together. I'm not gay. I filed the first bill for gay people. In fact, the right for gays to get married, the lead case was my case. When the court said in Baird v. Eisen said, if the right of privacy means anything, the right of the individual to be free, free to decide whether to bear or beget a child. We need each other. We need each other. I'm of the belief that we are brother and sister. Love each other, care for each other. Don't talk about it, do it. So in conclusion, no way did I mean to offend anyone's religion, but I am a fighter and fighters sometimes fight and fight. Okay, any challenges, questions? Thank you so much. Uh, that was an amazing, yeah. fascinating talk. And thank you for your life's work as well. Um, we do have some time for questions. Um, I'm gonna take my privilege to ask the first question, but then um, Peter will be running the Q&A after that. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll ask my question first and then we can go over the, the Q&A. Um, what do you think is the, the next fight that we need to fight uh, for reproductive rights? We've got to stand up to bullies of all types. Whoever, any politician who says I'm anti-women's rights to birth control or abortion, I would just pick at them. I would do everything to run somebody again, run for office. I ran against Kennedy, by the way, in Boston. No chance of winning, but he wouldn't take a stance on birth control. So sometimes you've got to be able to politicize. I, get me to come and speak before some group, if you know that. You know, I've never written a speech. I still think I'm reasonably effective. I remember most of my court cases, uh, even at 88. <laughs> Almost 60 is a long time to be fighting in a movement. But this is what I live for and fight for. I'm very fortunate I have a wife who's written a book that hopefully will be coming out soon. Uh, and a wife who's been more strength to me than I can ever tell you. Uh, I've never had that before. Uh, so uh, we can pick it, we can run for office, we can donate to groups that are pro-choice. Get votes. What? Votes. Uh, yeah, get votes, yeah, that's Make sure you vote. Boy, that's so crucial. Uh, I don't know, uh, what honey? Oh, okay. Yes. Any other questions? Absolutely. Um, so we're going to open the floor to questions. I remind you to ask a question, not make a statement. Uh, try to limit your question to under one minute. We'd love to hear from new voices, persons who might not have asked questions in the past. And if you prefer to put questions in the chat window instead of asking them yourself, we'll be taking questions that way too. Um, so uh, Peter, you want to Take over the Q&A. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Baird. You're a hero. If you could have read the, uh, the chats here. <laughs> yeah. Let's start with Janet Glass. Well, I don't know what the chats mean because- uh, That's okay. No. There's a, lot, <laughs> a, lot, a lot of people are, are singing your praises. Thank you. No, I, it's, you don't know how important that is to me because I get scarred and you hear a lot from the anti, so it's nice to hear you say that. Absolutely. Janet Glass. So thank you for saying yes to me when I asked you to speak. We are really honored by your story and your presence. Um, my, my question is, would you mind sharing with others that uh, a film is, a documentary film is being made of your life? I can't talk about it at their request only for the reason that uh, I have enemies that come out of all over the place and they're fearful of their funding for it. Okay. So they asked me not to say much about it. So I just said it's being done. And the reason that I'm so happy that it's being done is the fact that 
the only means of communication is really through the media. And my golly, when you have people like Betty Fidan, who's now deceased, but uh, who say that I'm a government spy, why do you say that for? I mean, the government's been after me for a long, long time, jailed me eight times. So. David Bland. Thanks, Peter. And thank you, Dr. Bird. That was a really inspiring speech. And I'll send you the contents of the chat window so you can see what we're talking about. I just have one question. Has there been any kind of rapprochement between Planned Parenthood and you? Um, uh, there's no reach. I mean, I've reached out to them. The older I have gotten, the slower I've gotten. <laughs> I can't do all those things physically that I want to do. Uh, but uh, they really, if you ever watch them on TV, even this past round of events going on before the Supreme Court appointees, uh, they're on all over the place. They still say how they legalize birth control. And I sit back and I say, wow, I'll always reach out to them because the greater good is to help women. Uh, they have wealth. They have lots of money, funding. I'm not good at doing that. I don't know why. Uh, there was a time. I got, you were very effective without the money. Yeah, Joni so is my wife. It doesn't take a lot of money. It takes a lot of strategy. My wife says it takes a lot. It does take strategy. Right. And it takes a degree of courage that if you're willing to go into a cage and march into My favorite song I once sung at my funeral is The Impossible Dream. I love that song, to fight the unbeatable foe. You know, and I have no qual against anybody's religion. My only qual is stay out of my bedroom. I don't need you to tell me what's moral. I think I'm doing okay mor morality-wise. Uh, but don't tell me how evil I am or tell my kids how evil I am. Okay, Jessica, Jessica Wilson. Hi, I hope you can hear me. I'm on the, um, I'm driving right now. So I'm on my, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you loud and clear. Oh, great. Um, so I have a little bit of a complicated question. My son has Down syndrome, so I'm very aware of, um, you know, prenatal testing and yep. options for um, abortion in cases of positive um, diagnoses, prenatal prenatal diagnoses, but I'm also pro-choice. And, um, you know, a lot of us pro-choice parents of Down syndrome children are um, pro-information where, you know, we say, we're not gonna talk about a woman's right to choose we obviously hope that they get the information that you're not choosing to um, have an abortion because you don't want to bring a certain type of person into the world. However, I am also very disturbed by uh, laws that are making pre positive prenatal diagnoses a reason to forward anti-choice um, laws. So I was wondering what your perspective is on that. And I'm going to mute myself because my son's making noise. Well, wait, I, hold it before you, I don't quite understand. So, um, so there are laws being passed that are saying that um, if you have a positive uh, prenatal diagnosis of Down syndrome, you may not get an abortion. In other words, no selective abortions for, um, for any sort of... Uh, prenatal diagnosis, um, you know, and it's, 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 it's disturbing, you know, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm pro-choice, but I'm also pro-information about the value of my child and his diagnosis. So, you know, there, there are some questions there about. My, my philosophy know, is a very, very. Taking advantage of that. Okay. My, my philosophy is a very simple one. Uh, regardless of age, regardless of marital status, only one person has a right to make a decision about her body, and that's the woman involved. I told you I had a 12-year-old child come to me, raped by her father, uh, and we aborted her free. I've had uh, the oldest patient, believe it or not, was a 54-year-old from University of Massachusetts who came to me, never thinking she could ever get pregnant, somehow got pregnant. Uh, my belief is women can die of childbirth. Women can develop toxemia pregnancy. Uh, lots of things can go wrong. 
uh, when men come to me and say, well, it's my pregnancy, I have as much right. I say, well, what's the death rate for us men in the waiting room? No man has ever died of childbirth. Women have, women have suffered. And a lot of men have abandoned women once they've had a child. Uh, so all I say to you is, my answer has always been, there should be no law telling a woman what to do with the body, whether she has a right to use birth control or not, or the right to have an abortion or not. It's her decision. I've always said if men had one menstrual cramp, boy, there'd be no opposition from the male legislators. Thank you. All right, uh, Mel Gardner. Is that your name? There we go, unmute. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Baird. I wondered if there's anyone today who's doing work that you feel like, yeah, that's what I'd be doing if I was trying to further the actions um, that need to be done. Is there anybody who you see out there carrying the tor carrying on your torch? Oh, there's a lot of things we could be doing. Oh, how do I say, say this? She's asking if you see someone nowadays that does what no, you're doing. No, nobody, uh, nobody I know does what I do. And I don't mean that arrogantly, I just don't know. I'll give you for instance, uh, how, why can't we put the opposition on the defensive? We are called murderers, evil. Uh, the titles I've been given, I mean, it blows me away. And every time I get a title, he's a devil, he's a murderer. New York Times headline, Baird, devil of abortion, quoting the Catholic Church. You know. Don't you realize when I'm called the devil, how many death threats that brings me and members of my family? You, you can't do that. So, but there are things that we can do individually. Why can't you economically boycott the business holdings of the church? For instance, Christian Brothers Wine owned by the church, Monk's Bread owned by the church, uh, Trappist Jams, Massachusetts, Smith, owned by the church, boycott them. How about this one? Wow. How about this one? Would you consider supporting legislation calling for the economic boycott of the church in the sense that they are uh, doing work for a foreign power, register as a foreign government power, lobbyist? Baird, what are you talking about? The Vatican heads the Catholic Church, 23 acres got its own stamps, its own fair, fair, got its own government, own flag, everything, right? It's a government. Who appoints every cardinal? It's the Pope. Pope is the head of the state. Oh, wait a second. Do you know of a single, single priest, a single bishop who says, it's okay to get an abortion? They lobby against it. It's okay to use birth control? They lobby against it. It's okay, it's okay to be gay? They lobby against it. So they lobby, the Foreign Lobbying Act says, if you lobby for a foreign government, you must register as a lobbyist. Why don't we do that? Why don't we do that? Because it takes guts to say, hold a Catholic church, you can't have it both ways. You can't violate our court that says separate church and state, but then we can say, but we're gonna fight against your right to an abortion. Of course, we're morally superior to the Jews who support abortion, or the Protestant Council of Churches who support abortion. So it just takes creative thinking and guts. Okay, next. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Baird. Okay, Rachel. Back Listen, back. I gotta stop because I don't know how to handle this. I've been called the devil, not the devil. I've been called all sorts of titles. I went to medical school, but I never finished because my daughter was born in the middle of medical school. Uh, so I'm not a doctor, but what I know, <laughs> I know as well as anybody, physician in this field, as it relates to this movement. But I know the law, and I'm not a lawyer, mind you. Most lawyers would give their right arm to be heard once by the Supreme Court. If you're heard five times, it's okay, you know? Because if you're creative in your thinking, uh, you can bring about changes. Okay, I'm sorry. That's okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Baird. Um, and I will say it is my my 
pleasure and privilege to work every day with young medical fellows who are being trained uh, to provide abortions and uh, reproductive rights care as well as in advocacy. So hopefully one of those young people will. Well, they are, they all, they all are making a difference every day. So um, carrying on the fight. <laughs>